So the name of our presentation is Liquid Gold Fools Gold, and this is an analysis and we'll be proposing treatment of the Superfund site one in San Fernando Valley, California. Next slide. And then these are our team members. Uh, next slide. And so for the introduction, uh, over 50% of the drinking water that runs through distribution in San Fernando Valley and also the greater Los Angeles area is imported from distant sources. Uh, groundwater remediation cannot solve water sustainability by itself, but it can certainly improve the situation by providing more access to non-contaminated water. We'll be focusing on how to reduce the specific contaminants in the San Fernando groundwater underneath Superfund Site 1. Next slide. So in the 1980s, uh, industrial factories in the aerospace industry, such as Lockheed Martin and Honeywell International, dumped their waste, which included solvents and degreasers, and the groundwater eventually became contaminated with VOCs such as PCE, TCE, and a heavy metal uh, uh, called hexavalent chromium. This renders the groundwater unusable and dangerous until these contaminants are heavily reduced. Next slide. And so the goal and solution, the goal is to achieve a clean, local, and more sustainable source of water. This goal can be achieved through groundwater remediation methods in order to reduce VOCs, uh, as mentioned in the previous slide, PCE and TCE, as well as the hexavalent chromium. We will focus on the current methods that are being used by the EPA and in turn propose a more efficient and potentially effective method. Next slide. All right, cool. I'll be going over some site details. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in this area, it's one out of the 97 Superfund sites in California. Um, and a Superfund site is just an area that needs long-term cleanups for hazard contaminants. Um, our area covers Northern Hollywood and Burbank and is about 20 square miles of land and about eight square miles of groundwater. Um, and this area is part of the San Fernando Valley Basin, which is a vital source of drinking water for about 3 million people. So groundwater pollution is a big deal for people living in, South, in Southern California. Uh, next slide. Um, in terms of the soil in this area, um, there's about like three main parts, um, urbanized land, sandy soils, and other minor parts. Um, urban land includes pavements and roads and has like a terrible water infiltration rate. Um, so there's a lot of runoff when it rains. Um, in contrast, the sandy soil has like a moderate to high in water infiltration rate. Um, and you can see that in the high, mid to high hydraulic conductivity values. Um, and it just shows that um, there's potential for groundwater recharge in, this, in about half of this area. Uh, next slide. Um, and there are three main contaminants in this area, PCEs, TCEs, and chromium-6. And um, Henry will cover that next. Thank you. I will be going over the pollutants now. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the first contaminant is PCE. And the exact source of origin is unclear, but industrial machinery in the 1940s required extensive dry cleaning, which PCE is mainly used for. Uh, PCE does not form naturally in nature, so their occurrence in the environment is linked to spills and industrial waste. Moreover, according to the International Agency for Research on Cancer, PCE is classified as a group 2A carcinogen. Uh, next slide. And the second contaminant is TCE. TCE is very similar to PCE, but a couple main differences are that TCE is less dense, more soluble, and more volatile compared to PCE. Um, according to uh, the IR, IARC, TCE is a group one carcinogen. And according to the World Health Organization, the max levels allowed in water is only 0 0.02 milligrams per liter. Uh, next slide. And the third contaminant is chromium-6. Chromium is an element found naturally in the environment and is mainly used to make steel and as an additive to limit corrosion. However, chromium-6 does not form naturally in the environment and its presence is an indicator of industrial waste. Uh, moreover, chromium-6 is classified as a group A carcinogen by inhalation and as a group D carcinogen by oral exposure. Uh, Brian will go over the current treatments. Next. All right, so the most uh, notable treatment efforts that have been made at this site 
are the two treatment facilities, one in the Burbank Operable Unit and one in the North Hollywood Operable Unit. Uh, both were initially designed to treat VOCs, so because of that, they have implemented a GAC and air stripping combination treatment. And uh, they've yielded promising results in reducing VOC levels, but uh, with some caveats. Next slide, please. So the because they're XC2, uh, groundwater pumping proves a little expensive with time. And as the groundwater plume within the site migrates around, it becomes more expensive to keep uh, pumping from areas of high concentration for optimal treatment. And continued pumping also leads to a decline in water table levels, uh, which will just further exacerbate pumping prices, uh, just environmentally and financially. And in addition, these treatment facilities also require extra infrastructure to treat for chromium as well. So uh, with this in consideration, we look to more in situ treatment solutions as alternatives. So we will first go over to backup treatment solutions and later we will elaborate on our primary treatment solutions for the site. Next slide. The first of the two potential treatment solutions for the remediation of the San Fernando Superfund site was the process of oxidation. So oxidants are pumped into the soil through injection wells to reduce contaminants to their non-toxic forms. For the hexavalent chromium on our site, scleroglucan fluids could be injected into the wells and then trap the hexavalent chromium in gel-like fluid to prevent movement and proceed to reduce the chromium to its non-toxic CR3 plus form. For the VOCs TC and PC on the site, a form of oxidation dehalogenation could be used on our site where anaerobic microbes are injected into the wells to target the contaminants and reduce the chlorinated solvents converting the VOCs to safer forms. Um, we chose not to go with this method of remediation because of um, the expensive nature of the treatment method as well as the toxic nature of the oxidants themselves that require heavy care when administrating this treatment on the site. Next slide. Yeah, so one other type of remediation that we looked into was bioremediation, uh, which is similar to oxidation, but it specifically uses microorganisms to break down and reduce the contaminants. Uh, and while this process is cost effective and sustainable, there were a few limitations that ultimately steered us away from choosing this. Um, it, first of all, it's a timely process compared to other methods, and it can be difficult to administer due to the fact that it requires significant contact uh, between the contaminants, the microorganisms, and the electron donors. Um, it is also dependent on many factors such as pH, temperature, and redox condition. And so thus in an actual groundwater plume, it would require extensive monitoring to ensure its success. So the treatment solution that showed the most promise was nanoremediation with some supplementary phytoremediation. So first, uh, a lot of studies have shown that uh, NZVI particles or nano zero valent iron particles uh, have been able to fully reduce chromium-6 and VOCs uh, within a relatively short turnaround time as well. So because of this, uh, we propose that there will be injection wells placed around the site that will inject uh, NZVI particles into the groundwater where it can move around with the plume and uh, treat all the contaminants. Uh, in addition, we propose that permeable reactive barriers or PRBs which also have screens of NZVI particles be placed in areas of higher contaminant concentration to help supplement this injection treatment. Yeah, and as a supplementary treatment method, we decided to include phytoremediation, which is its plans to take in and degrade contaminants. Uh, we decided to go with this treatment option due to its cost effectiveness and the aesthetic and environmental impacts it adds to the community. Um, however, due to the slower time vital remediation takes, as well as its limitations to only reach as far as the plant roots go, uh, we knew that this could only be used as a supplementary treatment method to the primary nano remediation method. Um, and so we decided to go with black cottonwood trees for VOC treatment and for bindweed for the chromium 6 plus treatment. Um, and our plan just involves using empty fields and lots um, over the contaminated groundwater site and planting these plants just to help clean up the soil underneath and to prevent further contamination in the groundwater. The next we discuss potential issues with our treatment methods of nano remediation and phytoremediation. remediation. Our first problem relates to the fact that nano remediation effectively depends on site conditions such as pH level. 
And we can use supplementary substances to keep pH at optimal levels in order to address this concern. Another concern relates to nanoscale zero valent ions particles instability and reactivity becoming low quickly, resulting in unsustained treatment timelines. Despite this, NVI should, uh, could still work for our site as even short life particles can meet short-term treatment goals. And finally, um, the final disadvantage of nanoscale zero valent iron is that its reaction byproducts can be absorbed by the cells of surrounding flora and induce toxicity. Uh, fortunately for this site, the groundwater table is a significant depth below the surface, so NZVI interaction with surface waters and subterranean life is negligible. And finally, we explore potential problems and solutions with phytoremediation. Phytoremediation treats contaminated soil at a uh, relatively slow rate, as we alluded to previously in our presentation. Uh, this issue motivates our decision in utilizing a more the more proactive technique of nanoremediation in conjunction with phytoremediation. And additionally, phytoremediation also poses risk of potential toxicity introduced to an ecosystem, which ultimately impacts biodiversity. Um, to solve this, ornamental plants could help address this solution uh, this problem, as they are inedible and less likely to impact an ecosystem's food chain. Additionally, the utilization of hyperaccumulator plants permits toxic resistance mechanisms such as compartmentalization of the vacuole or cytoplasm and biotransformation through reductants. And our last uh, consideration for our treatment solution as it pertains um, to phytoremediation uh, relates to our site itself. Being mostly paved with asphalt, um, this, there exist limits in phytoremediation that can occur. Um, nanoremediation supplemented with phytoremediation allows us to ameliorate this issue in highly developed areas where phytoremediation uh, cannot be as reliably depended upon. So our final thoughts. Uh, in conclusion, nanoremediation is a newer technology relative to pump and treat methods such as the granu granular activated carbon and air stripping, but with the correct optimization of NZVI, it has the potential to clean the San Fernando Superfund Site 1's groundwater most effectively through injection in uh, the permeable reactive barrier. And the use of phytoremediation can potentially protect water quality from future spills. And that's the end of our presentation.